Bienvenidos a un episodio más de Insights, un talk show científico en el que platicamos con expertos reconocidos a nivel mundial. Estoy muy emocionado porque el episodio de hoy les voy a presentar la entrevista que tuve con el doctor Steve Hayes. Eh, el doctor Hayes es uno de los académicos más citados de todo el mundo. Eh, ha publicado 44 libros eh, traducidos a muchos idiomas, muchos de ellos llegando a ser best sellers y ha sido considerado como uno de los 30 psicólogos más influyentes de la historia. Así que, pues como se podrán imaginar, para mí fue todo un honor tener la oportunidad de platicar con él. Los invito a ver la entrevista, no sin antes, como siempre, invitarlos a suscribirse al canal, seguir las redes sociales y darle clic a la campanita para que no se pierdan los videos que publico aquí en Neurosapiens. Well, hello guys, welcome to an all new episode of Insights, a series where we talk uh, with experts around the globe regarding aspects of health and well-being. And today I'm very honored to present uh, Dr. Stephen Hayes, who is a uh, Nevada Foundation professor in the Behavior Analysis Program at the Department of Psychology at the University of Nevada. He is an author of 44 books and nearly 600 scientific articles. His career has focused on an analysis of the nature of human language and cognition and the application of this to the understanding and alleviation of human suffering. He is the developer of relational frame theory and account of human higher cognition and has guided its extension to acceptance and commitment therapy a popular evidence-based form of psychotherapy that uses mindfulness, acceptance, and values-based methods. Dr. Hayes has been president of Division 25 of the American Association, uh, American Psychological Association, also of the American Association of Applied and Preventive Psychology, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy, and the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. He was the first secretary treasurer of the Association for Psychological Science, which he helped form and has served a five-year term on the National Advisory Council, Council for Drug Abuse in the National Institute of Health. So, uh, Dr. Hayes, thank you very much for, for being here with us. How are you? I'm good. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Perhaps I can be useful to your listeners. Excellent. So, uh, Dr. Hayes, could you tell us a little bit of how uh, the, your work started uh, precisely from, from a perspective of analyzing language uh, from, a, from a behavioral analysis point of view? Yes, I mean, I had a professional uh, interest in it as a, a clinical psychologist, but who's also interested in basic processes. And I couldn't quite figure out how to apply the concepts that were there in a way that really made sense to me um, and opened up really powerful new doors, uh, especially out of the behavioral tradition. I mean, I looked at uh, some of the things in higher cognition that Skinner had done, and it seemed like a step, but too small a step and so forth. And then I had the great fortune of developing a panic disorder. And it gradually took away my ability to function in normal ways. Um, as an academic, I was an untenured assistant professor, so beginning academic. Eventually giving a, a lecture to a small class of undergraduates was almost impossible. And uh, I would wake up from uh, a dead sleep already having a panic attack. And it, in that process, I did the logical, reasonable, sensible things I knew to do, but they all made it worse. And I did what I knew from cognitive and behavioral psychology, from psychotherapy methods that were evidence-based. And I came out of Dave Barlow's lab, one of the major, still to this day, anxiety researchers in the planet. I did my, uh, my uh, internship with David. 
But when I tried to apply exposure and other things to it, it just didn't seem to slow this thing down. It got worse and worse. And finally, uh, you can see a TEDx talk where I walk through this and I kind of hit bottom and in, a, in a, a night where I thought I was having a heart attack and then realized I was just having another form of a panic attack. And I did a 180 degree turn. Uh, I tell a story in The Liberated Mind, which is there over my shoulder. It's available, by the way, in, in Spanish. Um, of uh, as a young child uh, having uh, nightmares of um, dinosaurs coming to get me. And uh, they would come and look through the window with big, gigantic T Rex eyes, you know. And I'd run to another room and, and they'd come and they'd look through that window. And then I'd run. Finally, I just couldn't stand it. I'd run out of the house and then they'd start chasing me. And I'd have one of these dreams, you know, where no matter how fast you run, it's not fast enough. And uh, eventually they would catch up and they would eat me and I'd wake up. Somewhere in there I had a lucid dream. And I'm telling this story just by way of saying you kind of have the seeds of uh, success, and I can prove that to you pretty easily, even in your history, maybe even as children, and I certainly did, but somewhere in there, I had a, I realized I was dreaming and I, and I had this thought, you know, if I just turn and run towards the dinosaur, uh, I'll wake up. You know, you're just exhausted from this nightmare. And, and that's what I did. I turned and I jumped in its mouth and woke up. And then it occurred to me a few times, and within about a week, the dinosaurs didn't come to play anymore. They just were not interested in this game. <laughs> well, that kind of seed, which is in our wisdom traditions, our, our clinical traditions, but it's also in our heads and hearts because we've experienced life. We all know that running and fighting and hiding when difficult thoughts, feelings, memories, bodily sensations show up is bad. I can prove that to you very easily. And maybe it will take a moment to do that, but, but we don't apply it because we do have this one dominant organ, which is between your ears that doesn't know that and never will. And that's because this organ is so dominated by literal analytical problem solving symbolic language, I believe higher cognition. And so I went on a quest to try to understand my experience with because it, my life transformed. It was going one direction and then went another direction. How could that be? And it turns out these kind of transformational spiritual kinds of experiences, out of body experiences are very common. Something like 90% of the people, if you ask the question right, by the time you get even into your 20s and 30s, say that they've had such things. And um, I developed a theory that, that with my students, my clinical students, that went all the way down, eventually we called it the basic slide, to we slid all the way down to what is a word. And uh, we figured out what a word is. I mean, we really did come up with a new theory that's different it's never been on the planet before and we know it's important because if you have children who don't have normally developing language for example on the spectrum uh, uh children with autistic spectrum disorder or develop, de de developmentally delayed in other ways we know that these methods can accelerate their development their language development we know that we can go into schools and take children who have IQs that are normal and make them un uh, abnormal. We can raise IQ by eight, nine, 10 points. Even the parts of it supposedly you can't change. Uh, so you may not believe that, but you have to go look at the data. And then the data are considerable. There's about three, four or 500 studies on relational frame theory, which is what I'm talking about, which is this new theory. And there's about four or 5,000 studies on acceptance and commitment therapy or acceptance and commitment training when you're using it outside of a clinical context.
So the bottom line is my own suffering led me to a transformational moment, which led me to a, what the heck is that, which led me to a 40 year journey. And I was careful not to put applied methods out there. I did three studies on ACT, put it, published one so that my first student could get a job, put the others in the file drawer, not because they were bad, but because they were good and we weren't ready, and spent 15 years working out the basic theory, the measures, the concepts, of philosophy, of science. And then finally, at the turn of the century, put the method out. And um, five years later, the first self help book which then got a lot of publicity and beat Harry Potter for one glorious, glorious week on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, not more, I'd be a very rich man, but uh, that was my five minutes of fame. And, um, you know, so it became an overnight sensation, but it took uh, 20 years to that point, and it's now 20 years later. And uh, we know a lot about how the human mind works and how to help normal people deal with normal problems not just mental health, but behavioral health, not just that, but social well-being, and running a business, having relationships that work. And why? Because everywhere you go, your mind goes with you and your mind's the problem. It's, they're called mental problems for a reason. So mental strength and mental resilience, especially in this year of COVID, don't we all know that? It's not a one out of five issue, it's a five out of five issue. And it's not one hour a week, it's 24 seven. So. We need to do better. Behavioral science needs to do better and act as part of that. Sorry for such a long answer. I hope no, it, uh, it's great. People followed me. So this, uh, the development of uh, the relational frame theory was a, a consequence of this experience that you were talking about. Uh, and uh, as I understand, this precedes the development of act, right? They co-developed. Um, I was, I had that, uh, if you go look at my TEDx talks, I had two. The main one, there's an easy bit, bit.ly link, if you know how bit.ly goes, B-I-T period L-Y forward slash. If you put in Steve's first TED and capitalize Steve's and first and then T-E-D, all caps, if you do that, it'll show up. And about 600,000 people have looked at it or something like that, or three quarters of a million, something like that. A lot of people. And they've been moved by it because I've walked through this, the hell of my panic disorder and that turn. And then how it, not the geek science, but how it began to inform at, uh, there's a second TED that walks through some of the, a little more of the RFT side of it. But the RFT didn't come from that transformational moment that the challenge came from it. How could it be that I could be struggling and struggling and struggling and doing what every world famous psychologist tells me to do and I'd have no traction out of it. And then I do something that reminds me more of hippies and monks and meditators and people, you know, taking psychedelics, etc. I'm old enough to have been through that whole wave. And it's back now, and ACT is a big part of it, by the way, the psychedelic therapy now. Oh, I hope we don't do the same thing we did in the 70s. <laughs> but how could it be that you could just turn and see the life in such a fundamentally different way that a weight that's been on your shoulders is lifted or a fog that surrounds you suddenly clears? But I'm not the only one. It's very, very common. And there's a very, if you actually look at the moments that are in these people, actually know something about that. I'll give you an example. Since I'm a panic disorder person in recovery, I treat many people with anxiety and panic disorder. If you get a group of panic disordered people around in a group or something, and you have them tell their story, they're almost identical. They all have this quality. I was walking along, things were happening, things were tough, or there was a stress, or I took the wrong medication, or I was sick, or whatever. Something's going on that's stressing. And then I had my first panic attack. And then it was really horrible, and I was afraid it would happen again. 
So I watched for it, I avoided it. I, I made sure that I did the things. I brought out a friend, I, I took the medications. I, you know, I went to, and then it got worse. And so then I watched even more carefully and I limited my activities and I made sure, and then it got worse. And then, you know, everybody. Now, if you push a little harder, they'll say this. If somebody's had this for years. And then I got so exasperated by this horror and how it was taking everything away from me. I said, kill me if you're gonna. And then the fog lifted. Almost everybody who's had, who's had panic has had that experience. They reached bottom and they said, enough is enough. I don't care. Kill me. And the fog lifted. And then this organ, this stupid organ, that only knows how to one thing. Yes, it's where our intelligence is, but not all of our forms of intelligence said, ah, I have a new way of getting rid of anxiety. I'll just say, kill me if you're gonna. And then you do that in order to manipulate, not the way you did it first, where you gave up, you just sort of said, okay, okay. Where you actually turned to the dinosaur and said, eat, eat me, right, basically. No, now you're saying, I can run from the dinosaur even faster if I turn and say, eat, eat, eat me, and then run. No, you don't. You're not running any faster. It's going to catch up to you and it's going to eat you. What are you talking about? And so the paradoxical effects of releasing yourself from the control agenda. The only way I can move forward is to control my own emotions, which is a horrible idea. It has tremendous costs. Hits a point where you abandon it and immediately, just like my my transformational moment, immediately I knew I was onto something different. But usually what happens is that people start integrating that into the same thing they've been doing right along and then it doesn't work anymore. And then they say, oh no, see, I really am, blah, 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 blah. I was a false, I was, I was a look fool's gold. It looked like I was a way forward. It's not, it's not, it's more of the same. I'm just, ah. But it, you know, don't, I hope people don't understand that. I mean, I've been there, so I'm not making fun of anybody. If anything, I'm making fun of the dictator within that can fool us so easily. But you've been through it too. When you were, I bet you, just bet you, but maybe not, let me just see. When you were disappointed in love in some way, when you were betrayed, when you were lied to, when you were no longer found interesting, when whoever your lover was said, nah, I mean, when you caught your lover in bed with somebody else, when you had something happened, probably, you probably didn't have happy, happy, joy, joy relationships from the time you were born till now. My guess. Yes. Just a guess. Even in Mexico City, these things happen. Not so much in the US, but yeah. Well, what do you do on the other side of that? If you listen to the voice, what does it say? Finish this sentence. Okay. I will never be so again. I will never be happy again, maybe. Okay. What else? If you if you were betrayed, you're lied to, I'll never be so happy, yes, but also... Also, maybe I will never be close to someone again, or I will never... I'm not going to be so close. How I'm out, not be so innocent again. Mm, yes, also. How about I'll not be so vulnerable again? Definitely. <laughs> How about I'll not be so open again? Yes. It's not so easily. Okay. Well, watch what your mind's doing, and here's what it's saying. Because you wanted intimate, committed relationships, and that's not what you got. What you should do is take the steps that make it much more difficult ever to have those. Yeah. If you think it through, if you because look, if you have a relationship that, that's open, connected, intimate, it's going to be open. It's going to be risky. You can be hurt. If people are close to you, 
If you let them get beyond your defenses, you know it's dangerous. You just experienced how dangerous. You did it out of ignorance, out of innocence, and now you know better. So you'll watch out. You'll protect yourself. It's gonna be very hard to get through this shield. Maybe no one can make it. I'll just live inside this cage, waiting for someone to batter it down. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> You're yes. doing what's logical, reasonable, sensible, normal, and pathological. This is why psychological flexibility, which is the core features of ACT, a large meta-analysis with 12,000 people followed longitudinally showed that uh, it's one of the best predictors of whether or not you're going to have relationships that work. Okay. Because look, if you're going to defend yourself against connection, it's going to be harder to be connected. Hello. Don't you know that? Of course you know that. Why don't you do it? Because it feels risky. Yes. That's because it is risky. <laughs> so what? You can be hurt. Somebody, a friend of mine, Kelly Wilson, said, you know, relationships are the worst things humans ever invented, except for the alternative. You know, look, if you say, oh, no, I can have a relationship that's not going to hurt me at all. I can find the person. Okay, wait a minute, dude. Is that person going to die? Mm, yes. Yes. <laughs> Is it possible they'll die before you? Yes. There is. Will you feel abandoned? Well, maybe. Do you feel left behind? Yes. You might even be angry. Do you yes. think? Do you think you might also feel a hurt? That's just a hurt of loss. It's almost like it shouldn't have happened. Why? Did you, well, how come I didn't get to go first? Just, you know, wait a minute. So in other words, in order for you to be happy and to have relationships at work, you have to have life eternal with Prince Charming or, you know, Sleeping Beauty. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff of children's delusions. I mean, this is the stuff of life. And you know that. But this organ doesn't know it. So my point being, when we dug into it, we realized that how language and cognition, which is very recent on the block, you know, it, it's the evolutionarily recent process. If you do something like, if I take a pin and stick you and then do it several times and make a, make a sound like this, and then stick you, and then stick you. Eventually I'll go like that and you'll, you'll startle or you'll have a automatic emotional reaction. How old is that? It's half a billion years old. How do we know that? Every creature that evolved since the Cambrian, which is 545 million years ago, does that. Everyone, including humans. Yes. How many creatures do, oh, if I, if I open up my heart to that person, I might be hurt again? Only one. Yes. Now, in the midst of print pop pricks, yes. But assume that you were actually talking to somebody who's pretty nice to you. Have you ever watched dogs with what happens when people are pretty nice to them? Even abused dogs, yes, they're afraid at first, but then they're licking their hands or eating the treats. They're not going like, you might betray me later. I'm not eating that treat. No way. Mm. Only we can do that, right? How old is this process that leads to that? Well, if it's Homo sapiens, 300,000 years maybe, maybe 400, they don't know exactly. If it's the hominids, a couple million years, not 545 million years. And the chimpanzees who broke off, that was the last time to break off, that was 2.8 million years ago. They don't do it, number one. They don't do what your 12 month old baby does. We know from relational frame theory that predicts whether or not you're going to develop normal language along with all of these problem-solving strategies turned on yourself that gives you a way forward that's actually a way backward. 
that limits your capacity to be whole and free, to care and to love, to produce, to face your fears, to step into challenging situations where your mind's screaming at you, to be able to connect in consciousness with others, to pursue your values, to stick to your commitments. I mean, it predicts everything bad if you mismanage these things. So I think what's going on is that we are the species that invented a wonderful, spectacular, beautiful, incredible thing that's led to all kinds of wonderful stuff, such as me talking in real time to Mexico City as I'm sitting here in Reno. And we'll show you any painful thing happening in the world. We'll compare you to others anytime, any place. We'll feed you a constant diet, a diet of judgment. And we'll ask you to be aware of what's going on around the world, what's going to happen in the future, and to think in terms of all people. In other words, you're going to have to manage what only the monks and the wisest of us had, mm -hmm. this consciousness of people across time, place, and person, and a constant diet of the most challenging things that you can do to a human, which is the feat of pain, comparison, and judgment. Even non-humans in the forms, they can do it without language. And we've only done this in the last 15, 20 years. So no wonder it's a train wreck. I mean, our kids are a standard deviation worse. We just went through COVID. We're still climbing out. I say past tense because the US is finally hitting the point where I can say it in the past tense. But man, did we learn from that year that it's all of us who need strength and resilience mentally. And fortunately, behavioral science can distill that task down to four or five things. Just maybe six, six things to learn, maybe eight or nine, but not 120. Nothing so complicated. And you already know them anyway, but your mind doesn't. Uh, uh, so by listening uh, what what you just told us, I was thinking that uh, maybe in evolutionary terms, these kinds of uh, protective thoughts and approaches into uh, maybe avoid suffering or into avoiding uh, pain. Uh, well, I do think that uh, maybe they they evolved uh, because of adapt. Uh, or, or because of its adaptive value. But what you've been telling us is that maybe they don't hold this adaptive value anymore. Well, I don't think they actually ever held adaptive value. What held adaptive value is avoiding pain that's directly produced and stimulated to predict that it's about to arrive. Okay. So, you know, if, if I'm going to point you, prick you with a pen, we want to avoid that. If you're going to, you know, by walking that way and not have water or walking that way and not have food, we want you to learn that. By walking that way, a lion will chase us. We want you to learn that. And those processes are half a billion years old. They are allowed, you know, I mean, sponges and jellyfish can only do so much. They can't pursue, for example, things that they like or, or really avoid other than It's kind of reactive, protective kind of things after it already arrives, but they can't learn to avoid it before it arrives. They can't learn by association. Multicellular organisms do have that capacity, even some single cells do, but since the Cambrian. What language does, it allows you to harness those parts of the brain that are basic issues of defense, either like freezing and death feigning, it, And reptiles. And then when mammals uh, came along to, uh, 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 you know, to, to engage in more sophisticated forms of, uh, of escape in this, it, well, they're not, not the only ones, but the, what mammals did is actually restricted the automatic impact of the sympathetic nervous system to run or fight and to We still have this freezing response, it's still there. And I think depression's kind of like that. But we also are able to down-regulate that, mammals, and to be able to connect with others. But now we have this new thing 
that does this. Okay, let me just show, give you an example. Perhaps the people listening can think of one of their most painful memories. Just take a few seconds to think of one of your most painful memories. If I had you all wired up, your body is now responding differently. As if some of what that pain was is here now. What is actually here now? An old bald guy saying pain. What is that? It's a sound. Pain. Why would that sound produce this physical and mental effect on you? Because it's related to a quality that you learned of these things called painful experiences. It included some direct and physical. It might have been a train wreck or, or a car accident or a, an operation gone bad or, a, you know, it might have been that. It might have been a betrayal or rejection or the, an emotional pain. It might have been embarrassment or failure. It might be something like that. It might be your own dishonesty or having people lie to you. It might have been that. So, we don't know if it's cognitive, it's emotional, if it's physical, but it's painful. And you thought of it and you reacted to it. Well, okay, so here I'll give an example of something that is in the act work. Suppose uh, you are really bothered by thinking about that painful experience, whatever it is. And there's something in it for you. For example, that you were lied to and, and told that you're you're no good or I don't want you or you pick it. Describe the situation with a word that has the most punch so they have a little more specific. Pain is so general. We want a specific. In your own mind, think of, especially if you can find that it has something to do, it's sticky, it's you know one of the worst because it seemingly says something about you or about the world. Put that into a word. Could be like, I'm a loser or life's not fair or it's not safe or I'm no good or I'm unlovable or I'm a liar or I don't know. Okay, so for people listening, uh, take that thought, like whatever it is, I'm a loser, this has and mentally sing it to the tune of happy birthday. Just do it. If I had your body all wound up, wired up right now, it's responding differently to the same event. Yes. And notice that the the pain that was there was presented symbolically. It had a punch. We've now gone in and made it even more clear. So to have even more punch. And then we did a tiny little stupid thing. It's not to ridicule you. It's just to show that in the same way that a pinprick could be diminished by, uh, you know, wearing a thick glove or by putting a uh, Novocaine on the place where I'm going to prick you or cutting a nerve or there's many places. The, the impact, the painful impact of your history can be regular. That's verbally produced can be regulated by things that you do with language. You know, the, the, that one I just used is a diffusion method called so-called diffusion. That's a made up word. It means to reduce the domination of literal evaluative predictive language by changing the context of those words. So singing them is one example. That's what I just did. Or you could distill it down to words, say it over and over again for 30 seconds. 
Or you could save it, say it in the voice of Mickey Mouse or your least favorite politician. Okay. Or you could go back to the place where you first had a thought like that, picture yourself and how young you were, and take the thought that's really punching you right now and in your mind's eye have yourself as a younger age say those words and it'll pull compassion from you, not criticism, not avoidance, not running away. There's hundreds of these methods and it's just one of the six flexibility processes. You need to know how to rein in the excesses of your mind. It won't stop doing it. It's gonna keep doing it. It's gonna keep telling you, look, if out there you like this, suppose you had a thought basically that I'm bad. Let's just distill all those different thoughts down to I'm bad. And not that this, I'm not saying it fits everybody who's the, but just as a, if you think I'm bad, the, the little voice within says, well, you're not that bad. If you think, oh, I'm wonderful, I'm perfect. Then your little voice within says, no, you're not. In other words, you've got a little war going on because you've got multiple voices. Even children understand Goofy with horns on one shoulder and Goofy with a halo on the other shoulder. Four-year-olds understand this. They watch their cartoons because they're already arguing in their head about I'm good, no, I'm bad, or that's right, no, it's wrong. Well, that's never gonna stop. If it started when you're like three or four, and you're still doing it. How do you know? Just think I'm perfect and watch what your mind does. Just do it. It'll beat you to a bloody pulp to convince you that's not right. How about I'm the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. I'm human scum, you can't get lower than me. You might get closer than the first one, but you're not gonna be able to pull it off. <laughs> Say, no, come on. So my point being, behavioral science and the act folks are part of it have arranged hundreds, if not thousands of little kernels and tools that you can use. And once you know what the processes are that get in your way, that come from this wonderful, spectacular, amazing tool between our ears, but that is not everything. It's not the whole of us. There's things we learn by direct experience. There's intuition. There's a, a sense of awareness that's beyond categorization. Even the kind of language we're talking about, mm -hmm. when we're talking about the problematic ones, isn't the observe, describe, and appreciate kind. You know, if you see a sunset tonight, you'll go, wow, and then you'll shut up. You're not going to say, but it would be better if it had more pink. I mean, you're just not going to say that. Yes. But you'll say that to the person in the mirror. Oh, you're looking pretty good, but what about that? Oh, look, that wrinkle. Oh, maybe I should get a little, get a lift, you know. <laughs> yeah. You'll do that to yourself. But you know, in certain things, if you had a crying child in front of you, you'd probably say, wow, and you're not going to say, could you shut up? You're bringing me down. So how do we know sometimes to observe, describe, and appreciate? And other times, we're just going into problem solving, evaluating, predicting, changing, manipulating. Because we haven't put the mind on a leash. We're, we're, we're like driving a car without touching the steering wheel. It's not safe or not knowing where the brakes are, it's not safe. So you better learn how to rein in the mind and direct it, or it will take you on a, quite a ride. Yes. And you'll uh, have the one, visit the wonderful world of panic disorder, Woo or depression, or relationships breaking up, or yet again, choosing to date the wrong person and you should have known full well that's exactly who you should not be at some or another from the other side of the room. Oh, that looks attractive. I mean, everybody knows you know how to get in your own way. How do you learn how to get out of your own way? So that's what the act stuff's about. So, so uh, and, and as you mentioned before, it's not only in a clinical context, right? But also 
it's about life. It's actually a style of life. I don't say that usually because people think it's creepy and cultish. But if you had tools that would help you, let me just say what the six flexibility processes are. These are the tools that allow you to open up to your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, your memories, bodily sensations, but with a sense of perspective, a little bit of a gap so that thoughts aren't what they say they are, good, better, and different. They're just thinking, which you can use or not, depending if it's useful in this situation. So those are processes of opening. They have two features, opening to emotions and stuff, we usually talk about as acceptance kind of work or uh, uh, yeah, acceptance in the most com common term, or these kind of diffusion cognitive flexibility skills. Maybe just a way to say it that would not be technically speaking, you need emotional and cognitive flexibility. To be able to open to what's going on and to be able to feel, think many different things. Take what's useful, leave the rest. You need to be able to show up to the current situation. It's to know even what to do, you need to be here, outside and inside, and consciously from this part of you that is able to see and connect from consciousness, okay? Two features to it, flexible attention to the now, inside and out, and this kind of observing sense of self, this pure awareness, not even of anything yet, but just being aware. Well, if you do those four things, those are called mindfulness. Just look at all the definitions of mindfulness and they all have emotional and cognitive flexibility, flexible attention to the now from a witnessing sense of self. Some traditions, Buddhism hates talking about self, so then they talk about big mind, one mind, no mind, but it's all the same thing. I'm not talking about the self that can be evaluated. Yes. Not the 72 year old guy with wrinkles, not that. I'm talking about this self that was there in consciousness even before language when your mama looked in your eyes and said oh sweet baby and you started dumping endorphins because you were seen by kind eyes yeah and connected when you get those mindfulness skills what that means is you can show up and be here yeah well and then the question is okay for what now that you're here what are you going to do with it mm -hmm. well i don't know what are the qualities of being and doing you want to put in your life's moments? I don't mean just the goals. The goals are fine, but the goals have a finite end, you know, and then what? You accomplish them. Then what? Why did you have that goal in the first place? Yes. I'm talking about values. I'm talking about the direction you can take your life in. Things that are ineffable qualities of being and doing. Not in not ineffable in the sense you can't contact it, but they're not things that you can put in a box. And of course, when you have goals, that's fine, but make sure that it's on a values-based journey. I mean, there's lots of millionaires who, are, who kill themselves, lots, billionaires too, because they'll use money for a valueless purpose. And then when they have it for like, then I'll feel good about myself. No, you won't. You feel the same as you feel now. What are you talking about? That's like, you know, when I have my degree, I'll be confident. No, you won't. You'll just have a degree. What was it for? That's the values piece. And then the final piece over there is, how do you arrange your life's moments so that they're about what you deeply care about, what you deeply want, what you want to manifest in the world, what you want to be about, what this journey is about, where you're going. In other words, how do you build values-based habits? So I've given you six things, mm -hmm. emotional cognitive flexibility, flexible attention to the now from this witnessing perspective, taking sense of self, meaning and purpose by choice, your values and habits linked to them, committed action. If you do all those six things and socially extend them, like acceptance turns into compassion, values turns into joint actions, like in a couple, we value this, you know, being able to extend that to the we. Yes. If you can do that, uh, everything gets better. Everything. If you can't, if anyone is missing, well, it's like having a six-sided box without one side. 
you pull two sides out, you don't have a box at, at all. So work on all six, it turns out that mental health problems, if you see it right, are a perfectly good place to start. But you could start with a cancer diagnosis, or you could start with um, a business, or you could start with a relationship, or you could start with trying to do something about stigma and prejudice, or the climate change, or immigration, or poverty and starvation, or you know, I don't know, you can start anywhere. Yes, I, I think anything that uh, constitutes a, a challenge for the person, right? Yeah, ACT is, it, that's why it's called acceptance and commitment training. It, in therapy form, there's right now 616 randomized trials and about 40% of those are in mental health problems, which is a whole crazy thing. You know, we create these categories and shove people into it and they're very ill-feeding categories. I don't really believe in them very much, but about 40% have to do with behavioral health matters, diet, exercise, sleep, rising to the challenges of physical disease. And then about 20% sports, high performance, running a business, relationships. And so turns out the smallest set of things that does the most work known in behavioral science that is evidence-based in my opinion uh, is psychological flexibility, which is a model underneath ACT, mm -hmm. which emerged because it treats language in a new way that views uh, the core of language not as association but as relationships and that's too long a discussion to but fortunately there's so many good resources everybody listening if you even in spanish if you want resources you can find them professionally and for free on the internet just search for act or psychological flexibility and you'll find them and uh, If you want to find therapists in Mexico, if you go to contextualscience.org, right on the first page, find a therapist, put in your country or city, you'll see hundreds of people, many doing um, online and virtual work now in this year. And I think that's now permanent. So it's not hard to find. And uh, if you want self-help and stuff, we've shown that even $12 self-help books Not just that, I mean, the World Health Organization will give you an act cartoon book that's been tested for free, just download it. Okay. And so major, major things like the World Health Organization and so forth are actually giving away act tools because when they do the randomized trials, they're helpful. Yes. And if, if you're okay, I will leave in the, in the description some uh, of the links to these resources you mentioned as well as to uh, maybe some of the of your recent books where where people can maybe get a more in-depth idea of uh, of everything that you've talked about uh, and which you put in, a, in very uh, good examples. Muy bien. You know, I, if, they, if folks can read English, if they go to stephenchayes.com, if they want to get newsletters from me about once a month, I send them out. Stephen with a V, middle initial C, like in Charlie, H A Y E S dot com. I don't spam people, and it's a one click opt out. If you ever don't like it, you can stop with one click. Um, but there's so many resources out there now because we're really, we're a community that wants to give things away if we can. And um, there's lots of things you can pay for, but a lot of them are very, very cheap. and help is there and um, the cool thing about these kinds of methods as opposed to some of the others is that the processes have broad applicability so when you come in because of your particular problem whatever it is chronic pain tinnitus cancer diagnosis depression anxiety substance abuse relationship problems whatever it is you'll learn things that will apply to the next thing And that's kind of cool. Yes. Well, Dr. Hayes, I'm very, very grateful for uh, for your time, and I, I will want to take uh, a lot more. Uh, but well, I, I think uh, everything that you told us is well. I mean, 
I, I always tend to be more active in the conversation, but in this time I was very like, how do, I, I don't know how to say this, but when you're paying a lot of attention and you don't even uh, find the words to to keep talking, but I, I, I'm very grateful for, uh, for everything that you just taught us. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I feel some connection to Mexico, you know, mi esposa primera se fue una primera can mexican. Okay. Mostly means I know the curse words wives say to their husbands. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a, uh, a daughter who is uh, Mexican-American in, in part, and um, I've been to Mexico many, many times. So let me just say, as a way of closing, Forgive me for doing my rants. You know, I'm I'm an old man. I'm like talking to an old uncle on the porch in the rocking chair. You ask a question, I just talk. But if something in here resonated to people, if they sort of said, you know, that makes some sense, even though it's a little weird. Uh, I've been in this situation many, many times. There's something like six million act books and print around the world something like that that's rising fast every year the many many books mostly i've not written them hundreds hundreds written by other people i started it but i have helped create the community they have come up with even better ideas but i just want to say this if there's something in here that resonated and you need help in some way you want to be uplifted in some way you want something Think about pursuing it uh, because that little part of you, that little spark that says that sounds interesting, is usually a good guide. Conversely, if you're listening and say that's crazy stuff, I'm not doing that, or well, there's other evidence based things to try. I do think trying evidence based things are wise because there's many, many, many marketers and quick fix artists and snake oil salesman, as we say it in English, you know, people selling, selling, let's just say people selling, <laughs> we could stop the sentence. And you probably don't need another round of disappointment if you're suffering. Yes, I totally agree. And well, hopefully people will have or will get curious enough to, to look more into it, to be uh, I mean, to look for evidence-based uh, alternatives, as you say, because uh, it's very easy to get lost on this uh, maybe sea of misinformation and uh, marketing. Yeah, an attitude of kind of skeptical openness is good. You know, you never want to check your mind at the door. And if anybody ever tries to convince you, oh, there's studies, there's studies, and you say, where are they? Which are, oh, there's lots of where. Just walk in another direction. There's too many places that are selling too many things that are just not based on evidence. And if you go to the, if you search just a little bit about ACT, you'll see that it has a, a lot of support, which doesn't mean it necessarily applies to you or to everything. You know, not everything does. It may not resonate for you for various reasons. That's okay. But give it a shot, give it a go, and uh, you don't have to invest very much. I mean, 10 or $15 with a book, yeah. Or do quite a bit or just a, a little bit of time on the internet. So I hope I've been useful. That was my challenge. Thank you for the opportunity. Excellent, Dr. Hayes. Well, I hope you have a, a great day. And, and once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day.